that sense of complexity of the Bois de Boulogne, which made it an artificial place and in the zoological or mythological sense of the word, a garden. under my bedclothes, in my bedroom, and had fixed, approximately in their right places in the uncertain light, my chest of drawers, my writing table, my fireplace, the window overlooking the street, and both the doors. But it was no good my knowing that I was not in any of those houses of which, in the stupid moment of waking, if I had not caught sight exactly, I could still believe in their possible presence for memory was now set in motion. As a rule, I did not attempt to go to sleep again at once, but used to spend the greater part of the night recalling our life in the old days at Cambrai with my great aunt at Balbec, Paris, Doncier, Venice, and the rest, remembering again all the places and people that I had known, what I had actually seen of them, and what others had told me. I went to Boulevard Houseman and waited in the kitchen. I couldn't help feeling rather nervous in that great, strange, silent apartment I wasn't supposed to go into. And knowing he was there, invisible, and not even audible, the funny thing is that I don't ever remember being bored in the hours I waited. I didn't do anything. I didn't even read. And at first, never a bell ring. And never any visitors. Nothing. No one. This went on for days, and I thought Monsieur Proust never would send for me. When Nicola came back, he always asked, he didn't ring? And I said no. We chatted for a bit, and I went home. And then one day, all of a sudden, two rings. Perhaps I should say something about his room, because for all those years, it was his stage. And in a way, it was mine. The most striking thing in the room, apart from the cork, was the color blue, the blue of the curtains, to be precise, which reflected the big chandelier that hung from the ceiling, a sort of bowl ending in a point, with lots of lights and several switches, which was never lighted except for visitors, or when I tidied the room in Monsieur Prout's absence. Occupying the whole space between the two windows was an imposing rosewood mirror wall right the street, with bronze trimmings and a bracket sunbeam. That is to say, equally luminous, and presented to my imagination the entire panorama of summer, which my senses, if I had been out walking, could have tasted and enjoyed in fragments only, and so was quite in harmony with my state of repose, which bore like a hand reposing motionless in a stream of running water, the shock and animation of a torrent of activity and life.
at Combray, as every afternoon ended, long before the time when I should have to go up to bed and to lie there and sleeping far from my mother and grandmother, my bedroom became the fixed point on which my melancholy and anxious thoughts were centered. Someone had had the happy idea of giving me to distract me on evenings when I seem abnormally wretched. A magic lantern, which used to be set on top of my lamp while we waited for dinner time to come, in the manner of master builders and glass painters of Gothic days, is substituted for the opaqueness of my walls and impalpable iridescence, supernatural phenomena of many colors, in which legends were depicted as on a shifting and transitory window. But my sorrows were only increased because this change of lighting destroyed as nothing else could have done. The body the customary impression I had being of the same room, supernatural thanks to which the room as his deeds overcame all material obstacles. In it, everything that seemed to bar his room, way by taking now, each as it might be a skeleton and, and embodying it in himself. The door handle, for instance, over which, adapting itself at once, would float invisibly his red cloak or his pale face, never losing his nobility or his melancholy, never showing any sign of trouble as such a transubstantiation. I found plenty of charm in these bright projections, which seemed to have come straight out of a Merovingian past and to shed around me the reflections of such ancient history. But I cannot express the discomfort I felt as such an intrusion of mystery and beauty into a room which I had succeeded in filling with my own personality until I thought no more of the room than of myself. The anesthetic effect of custom being destroyed, I would begin to think and feel very melancholy things. The door handle of my room, which was different to me from all the other door handles in the world, the anesthetic effect of custom being destroyed, I would begin to think and feel very melancholy things. The door handle of my room, which was different to me from all the other door handles in the world, inasmuch as it seemed to open of its own accord, and without my having to turn it, so unconscious had its manipulation become, lo and behold, it was now an astral body for Golo. Beside the huge folding door that was always kept shut was a small door opening into a passageway through which he reached his dressing room a large bedroom which had been converted and a lavatory. This door was supposed to be used only by him, but gradually I came to use it too. But I never once did so of my own accord. As always, it was he who decided. Come through the little door, Celeste, he would say. He looked through the kitchen window of Rue Hamelin at Madame Standish and her family at dinner. He made only a brief appearance, as if he was just passing by. But in 30 seconds, everything was recorded, and better than a camera could do it, because behind the image itself, there was often he had a powers of observation and a single and a detail. memory. The way someone picked up the soft cell behind the image itself, and inclination there was of the head, a whole character analysis and a reaction based on a single he had detail. detail. The way someone when I expressed my surprise at this and inclination he said, of the head, but Celeste and a it isn't a gift he had caught on the it wing. It is an intellectual event. When I expressed so my surprise at this, until it eventually said, becomes a habit. But Celeste, lots of activities were forbidden to it me. It is an intellectual so I spend more event time that can be cultivated than most until it and eventually and watching becomes the habit. The time. I used to observe what sometimes other people did. I watched them with envy. Sometimes I watched and that them with envy. All the better. And that made me observe. I started all the when I was still a child. I started when I was Once still I a child. Once I began to have asthma. Once I, I began had to walk to have asthma. Of run. 
I had to walk in the Chatelain's Day, day and, in the the day, and in the prayer cut I spent hours Elias. watching the water I spent hours watching the water of the Loire reading and writing in the little reading summer house and writing with in nature little summer house all around with nature spread all around it was the same when I went with my people uncle in nature too and I saw the landscape shifting and, and by dint of watching and the observing village steeples you become interested in the relations between things people and nature through thinking too, about relations and foes and passes come, and by dint of watching and observing you discover the you become interested in them. the relations between things and through thinking about relations you come as scientists do to discover the laws that govern them he pointed to his eyes and brow and said it's all recorded here celeste without memory you can't compare and it is only by comparing that you can develop your thoughts. But it is never finished. That is why I always have to go see things or look at them again. And another time, and another the time, truth about and life another time, is in observation and, time, and memory. And time, Without them, time, it just passes by and is gone. I have put all my memory and observation in my characters to make them true. And to be true, they have to be complete. That is why each of them is dressed in what I have noticed or remember ever changing about people of the in real life. So that the walls were lined with a frieze of seascapes, interrupted only by the polished mahogany of the astral shelves. And so effective was this that the whole room had the appearance of one of those model bedrooms which we see nowadays in housing exhibitions, decorated with works of art which are calculated by the designer to refresh the eyes of whoever may ultimately have to sleep in the rooms, the subjects being kept in some degree of harmony with the locality and surroundings of the houses for which the rooms are planned. The truth about life is in observation and memory. Without them, it just passes by and is gone. I have put all my memory and observation in my characters to make them true, and to be true, they have to be complete. That is why each of them is dressed in what I have noticed or remember about people in real life. So the search for a new place went on, and finally we found Rue Hamelin. It was on the fourth floor with a lift. The house was number 44. I came back with all the details, and he made his decision. Ask her to let us have the flat on the fifth floor. I shall pay for it as if it were finished, but ask her to move the furniture downstairs. So the lease was signed. Mr. Of course, one day Hamlet was, was not full of our house men. noise, and the proof and is I that, to it, they as I had said, as they wished. Mr. Proust always considered it just a temporary refuge. We had also with the city. Nevertheless, to a certain the extent, the, the magic circle the was recreated, which now hung in the salon and the rue Hamlet, was smaller, as well was as the portraits furniture. of Madame Proust the layout and Professor Andrew Proust as before, the painting by Hulius, and of course, the portrait of Monsieur Proust by Jacques Emin Blanche. So once again, life and the machinery of his habits resume. The rings at the bell, the coffee in the afternoon, the long talks at night, the work of the books, the silence. The only difference was that Mr. Proust went out less and less there, as he plunged deeper and deeper into his work, the grave. And more and more often he said, I haven't much time, Celeste. And so it was that, for a long time afterwards, when I lay awake at night and revived old memories of Cumbrae, I saw no more of it than this sort of luminous panel, sharply defined against a vague and shadowy background, like the panels which a bangle fire 
or some electric sign would illuminate and dissect from the front of a building, the other parts of which remain plunged in darkness, broad enough at its base, the little parlor, the dining room, the alluring shadows of the path along which would come Monsieur Swan, the unconscious author of my sufferings, the hall through which I would journey to the first step of that staircase, so hard to climb, which constituted all by itself the tippling elevation of an irregular pyramid, and and as though there had been no time there with a little passage night. I must own that I could have assured, assured any questioner that Combray did include other scenes and it exists at other hours than these. But since the facts which I should then have recalled would have been prompted only by an exercise of the will, by my intellectual memory, and since the pictures which that kind of memory shows us of the past preserve nothing of the past itself, I should never have had any wish to ponder over this residue of Cambrai. To me, it was in reality all dead. Permanently dead? Very possibly. Very possibly. Well, my dear Celeste, I should tell you, it is great news. Last night I wrote the end. And then he added, smiling, and with that light in his eyes, now I can die. What are you doing behind my door, Celeste? I wasn't behind the door, Monsieur. Celeste, Celeste, don't lie. You are right, Monsieur, I was there. I was afraid you might need something. I just wanted to be near to be sure I could come in straight away. He didn't answer. Then he asked, You won't switch off my lights, will you? Monsieur, you know I have never taken up on myself to do a thing like that. It's you who give the orders. Don't switch it off, Celeste. That's a big fat woman in the room. A horrible big fat woman in black. I want to be able to see. Don't you worry, Monsieur. Just wait. I will chase her away. Is she frightening you? Yes, a bit, he answered. But you must not touch her. He had often talked to me about death through the years, but never in the form of the hideous woman in black who some people have said used to haunt him, especially on the anniversary of his mother's death. Is he dead? Yes, Celeste, it is over. It was half past four. I had seen the first one and then another of the rooms in which I had slept during my life. And in the end, I would revisit them all in the long course of my waking dream. Rooms in winter where on going to bed, I would at once bury my head in the nest, filled up out of the most diverse materials. The corner of my pillow, the top of my blankets, a piece of a shawl, the edge of my bed, and a copy of an evening paper, all of which things I would contrive with the infinite patience of birds building their nets to cement into one hole, rooms where, in a keen frost, I would feel the satisfaction of being shut in from the outer world, like the sea swallow which builds at the end of a dark tunnel and is kept warm by the surrounding earth. And where, the fire keeping in all night, I would sleep wrapped up, as it were, in a great cloak of snug and savory air, shot with the glow of the logs, which would break out again in flame. In a sort of alcove without walls, 
a cave of warmth dug out of the heart of the room itself, a zone of heat whose boundaries were constantly shifting and altering in temperature as guts of air ran across them to strike freshly upon my face from the corners of the room, or from parts near the window or far from the fireplace, which had therefore remained cold.
The sense of the complexity of the water guru, which made it an artificial place, and in the zoological or mythological sense of the word, a garden.